raise the flag. Light the cauldron. We, we declare, declare the, the game's Odyssey, Odyssey open. open. Welcome to the Games Odyssey podcast, your home for stories of glory from the Olympics and Paralympics. I'm Jonathan Jordan. And I'm Sarah Patton. We both love the Olympic and Paralympic Games, and we love history. But most of all, we love Olympic and Paralympic history. From the epic and inspirational moments we all love, to the, well, the more bizarre and controversial moments, we're fascinated by it all. Which is why we are on a journey through all of the Olympic and Paralympic Games, from the ancient Olympics held at Olympia, all the way to now. Have you ever wondered how the Olympics split into summer and winter games? Well, then you're in the right place, because that's exactly what we're talking about on today's episode. And I have to be completely honest and say that I'd never heard this story before, so I'm definitely glad that we're covering it. Sarah, how about you? Have you ever heard this story? Actually, I've not. I just knew that this was the time in history that we got a winter games, but I never took time to read about how it all unfolded. So with you, I'm also excited that we're talking about this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, It feels like something I should have looked up long before this, but... (laughs) No, same. I feel like, take my fan card. Why, Why had I never really researched this on my own? I don't know. Right. And it is a little bit of an unusual story how the Winter Games came about. So we're going to dig into that. And uh, just like we've been doing uh, this season, we're going to start off with a little bit of an overview of what we're going to cover in the episode uh, before we get into some highlights. So today we're headed to Chamonix 1924, the first Winter Olympiad. Uh, After the debut of ice hockey at the 1920 Games in Antwerp and the return of figure skating, there were those who thought that there should also be a separate winter games. But then there were others who did not. (laughs) Even though the IOC had not officially sanctioned a separate Winter Olympics, the French Olympic Committee decided to take it upon themselves to create a winter sports event, which is now recognized as the first Winter Olympiad. Uh, So again, I know we're both big fans of the Winter Games. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. it's fun to finally actually get to talk about more winter sports. So uh, Sarah, take us away into some highlights. Yes, yes. Like you said, we are huge winter fans. Well, winter sports fans, not winter fan. I will be (laughs) clear on that. Winter sports fan. Uh, Some highlights of Chamonix 1924. The games ran from January 24th to February 5th, 1924. Some sources say there were 312 athletes from 19 countries. Olympics.com says 260 athletes from 16 countries. We're honestly not sure why the discrepancy. Those nations that did participate included Australia, Austria, Belgium, Canada, Czechoslovakia, Finland, France, Great Britain, Hungary, India, Italy, Latvia, Nepal, Norway, Poland, Sweden, Switzerland, the United States, and Yugoslavia. So that's a pretty impressive list there. Yeah, it's a good start. (laughs) Yeah, I'd say. The two largest delegations were from France and Team GB, both with 41 athletes. And there were 13 women who competed. So it's great that the women are starting right out of the gate. Not, I mean, not a ton of them, but happy that they were there. And there were 17 total medal events across 10 sports. Alpinism, bobsleigh, or bobsled, as we call it in the United States, cross-country skiing, curling, figure skating, ice hockey, military ski patrol, its only official appearance, but it's a predecessor to biathlon, Nordic combined, ski jumping, and speed skating. Yeah, so that's an interesting list. There's a lot of things in here with both the countries and the sports that feel really familiar. Some of these countries that we see on here continue to do really well in the Winter Games. But I have to ask, 
which country of those that you listed off do you think is the most surprising to be on the list for the first Winter Games? You know, I was surprised to see Australia on yeah. there. <laughs> what about you? Is that is that the one you were surprised by? I think Australia is very surprising, but probably the one that surprises me the most is India, because we just mm. don't typically think of India as a winter sports country. But of course, they do border there with the, um, oh gosh, I'm blanking, the mountain range, the biggest mountains in the mm-hmm. world, the Himalayas. Uh, so, so it, maybe it does make a little bit of sense that there would maybe be some skiers from India in the mix. I don't know. I, I just found their inclusion a little surprising. Wasn't, wasn't expecting it. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's fair. I mean, India is such a gigantic country Yeah, that, you know, I mean, kind of like the United States that, yeah, we have little pockets of winter and snow, but if someone just thinks about, you know, the outline of the United States, they probably think, oh, beaches, California, the Gulf Coast, Texas, and, you know, I don't know, water and all that. So you don't really think snow and ice. I I guess I'm with you that I could see why I would think India, like, they're close to an ocean. (laughs) Like, they're in the ocean. (laughs) So why would they have snow? But it's just, it's huge. So, but yeah, I'm with you. It was a little bit surprising, but I'm happy that they were there. No, me too. And like you already said, it's a pretty impressive list for the first Winter Games. Uh, So that's exciting to see that a lot of people seem to be on board. But uh, we will get into the story of how these games came about, obviously. But first, we are going to take a little break and then we'll return to talk about how (laughs) how bonkers it really was that these games were started up. To begin with. Okay, so during the early planning for the 1916 Berlin Games, there were discussions about having a skiing Olympiad held in the Black Forest. But obviously, that got scrapped when the Great War broke out, and then the Berlin Olympics were completely canceled. So... It's one of those things where, yeah, it didn't happen, but the idea of some sort of separate winter event was starting to be a thing (laughs) in in the Olympic movement. And then, as we already mentioned in the overview, after the inclusion of both ice hockey and figure skating in the 1920 Antwerp Games, there were some members of the IOC who felt really strongly about creating a separate winter Olympics Games. But then there were also members of the IOC who were strongly against it. Now, what's really interesting is that some of the strongest opponents to the idea of a Winter Games were actually the Scandinavian members of the IOC, which, looking at the medal tables, wouldn't you say that does feel a little surprising? Yes. I mean, like, this is their time to shine. Yeah, you would think. But uh, this is going to be a little bit of a flashback to our Stockholm 1912 episode. The reason those countries weren't interested in having a separate Winter Olympics is because they didn't want it to overshadow the Nordic Games. So if you remember that episode, we talked about Victor Balk, who was an IOC member and was one of the lead organizers for the Stockholm Games. He was one of the founders of the Nordic Games. So that was his baby, and uh, he didn't want his baby to get replaced, right? So so at the time, they were kind of like, no, don't step in our territory. This is our thing over here. But the head of the organizing committee for Paris 1924 was this guy named Franz Reichel. Now, he was a former athlete and a sports journalist. Uh, in fact, he had actually been the press journalist for the Sorbonne at the time in 1894 when the Olympic movement began. So he was kind of around since the beginning of all of this history that we've been covering so far. And he was also at the inaugural Modern Olympic Games in Athens 1896, representing France in athletics. And then four years later... 
he was actually on the French rugby union team that won gold. So, yeah, this guy had very strong ties to the Olympic movement, but more significantly to Baron Pierre de Coubertin. So in 1921, Reichel, along with the rest of the French Olympic Committee, asked the IOC, hey, would it be cool if we host a winter sports week during the lead up to the 1924 games in Paris? And the IOC said, yeah, sure, I guess we can get behind that because they weren't asking for a separate winter games technically. And in fact, it was actually going to be considered a part of the 8th Olympiad in Paris. So then during the IOC's Congress in Lausanne that happened that same year, once again, the idea of a separate Winter Games was brought up. But then Pierre de Coubertin said, guys, guys, listen, this isn't what we came here for today. How about we just table this discussion until next year? Let's have a special separate meeting just to discuss Winter Games and where they could be hosted. And to me, it kind of sounds like he was more just trying to keep the peace, that maybe there were some feelings (laughs) uh, getting expressed in the meeting. And so everyone kind of agreed to that. You're right. This isn't what we need to be discussing right now. But then this meeting that he had suggested just never happened. Um, I guess life happened. I don't know. People had other things to do. So it just kind of got forgotten about more than anything else. But meanwhile, the French Olympic Committee kept their plans for the Winter Sports Week. And in June of 1922, they had their own meeting with representatives from ice hockey skiing and skating federations to firm up some of the details for the winter week, including the decision to host it in Chamonix, located at the foot of Mont Blanc in January of 1924. There were only three venues for the games, a bobsleigh track, a venue for ski jump, and then what's now called the Olympic Stadium of Chamonix for everything else. The stadium was large enough to hold 45,000 people and was originally used for equestrian events, having been opened just a few months before the Games. The opening ceremony consisted of the athletes marching from the village of Chamonix to the skating rink inside of the Olympic Stadium, led by the French Blue Devil Marching Band. Because of the rules at the time, they had to march in their sportswear and carry their equipment with them, <laughs> which <laughs> could you imagine the chaos <laughs> if that were still the case? <laughs> so I have to wonder if the Bob sledders had to carry. <laughs> That's what I want to know. <laughs> had to carry the sled. Yeah. Like how extensive is this rule in terms of carrying your equipment with you during the opening March? Uh That's very interesting, and frankly, I'm glad that this tradition has gone by the wayside. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. Well, and I also, I don't know if you know the answer to this, but could it just be the equipment that they were using while competing, or would this involve practice equipment, too? And the reason that I say that is, I mean, I'm thinking about curling care, that Mm. the stones are provided when they're competing, but also they want to practice. So maybe the stones were provided yeah. in the practice rinks. I mean, that's how it is now. But th- I'm just imagining these curlers carrying these big stones, <laughs> which just sounds awful. So hopefully they didn't have to do that. But <laughs> Yeah, hopefully not. But no, I don't know the answer to that. I didn't dig that deep into whether it was just the, yeah, they're, practice equipment or what they were using at that moment. Either way, for whatever reason, it was a rule that they had to carry it with them. So there you go. That was a thing. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, but yeah, so getting into the stadium, then you had uh, Gaston Vidal, who was the undersecretary for physical education, which apparently is a real job title. Um, not sure what else to say about that. Uh, but he was the one who actually officially opened the games. And then here's where things get kind of interesting. 
In his opening speech, Vidal declared the Chamonix Games uh, that they were being hosted under the high patronage of the International Olympic Committee, which was technically true, and that they were being celebrated in celebration of the 8th Olympiad, which was also technically true. And then French flag bearer uh, Camille Mondrion, who was also a competitor in the military patrol event we're going to talk about here in a little bit, uh, he was the one who delivered the Olympic oath for the athletes. Also, the official poster for the Games declared that they were part of the 8th Olympiad, uh, which we kind of talked about already. So it was one of these weird things where even though the IOC hadn't explicitly called them the Winter Olympics, the assumption was that all of the events happening were Olympic events, even if they had not featured previously in any of the other Olympic Games. So to me, it just seems like they hadn't completely thought through the long term ramifications of giving the blessing to the winter week, because hosting it this way and giving it their blessing and really all the support that they seem to have given to it, it really actually forced the hand of the IOC to officially make a decision about whether they would continue having winter games so the following year, May of 1925, I know we're kind of jumping in time here a little bit, but the IOC then officially amended the Olympic Charter to stipulate a separate Winter Olympiad that would be hosted in the same year and by the same host country during each Olympic cycle. And then another year after that, in 1926, during their Congress they held in Lisbon, the IOC decided to retroactively acknowledge Chamonix as the first Olympiad of the Winter Olympics. So, again, this is one of those things where if you look up the official poster, it still says the 8th Olympiad on there because that was what it was supposed to be, was part of the Paris Games. But now they're saying, well, it's actually the first Winter Olympics. So... As a consequence of all of this, uh, 1926 was also the last time that the Nordic Games would be hosted. So just like the Scandinavians were afraid would happen, the Winter Olympics, once they were officially endorsed by the IOC, they completely replaced the Nordic Games and became their own thing. So a lot of it just seems a little messy with how it came about. But I don't know about you. I kind of love that it happened <laughs> this way. Oh. oh, yeah. I think it's a great story because it's kind of like, well, it's going to happen whether you want it to or not. So right. let's just go yeah. with it. Well, and I especially love that they retroactively decided, eh, let's just call it the first Winter Olympic mm -hmm. Games, even though it was two years ago. Again, we're seeing the Olympics get more organized as we go through the history. And this is one of those kind of last bits where it's really kind of messy, but in a fun way. <laughs> But on that note, now that we understand the background, uh, we're going to take a little bit of a break and then we're going to come back. And like we always do, we're going to get more into the athletes and events and some of the fun stories that happen there. So uh, we will be right back in a second. So as I mentioned earlier, one thing that makes the Winter Games different than the Summer Games is that we get to see women participating from the very beginning, which is pretty exciting. There were a total of 13 women who competed in the games, all of them in figure skating. Figure skating was held outside at the Olympic Stadium and routines were accompanied by a live band, usually playing <laughs> marching tunes, which let's get back to the live music because <laughs> I love that so much. Uh, <laughs> it, it's a fun concept. <laughs> it is. But if somebody messed up in the band then what happens? I don't know. Like, yeah. if it throws off the skater, but whatever. They're all professionals. Not important at this moment. Um, yeah. So going back to the actual <laughs> event, the women's event was won by Austrian Herma Planck Zabu, who was dominant in women's figure skating through the 20s, winning five world titles from 1922 to 1926. In the pairs event, the Austrians also dominated with Elena 
Engelman and her partner, Alfred Berger, taking gold. And there's a video on olympics.com where you can see part of their routine. We'll put the link to that in the show notes. Yeah, it's pretty fun to see that old footage. And the fact that someone was actually yeah. filming it is even more fun. Props to them for being able to look down into the future and say, someone might want to yes. watch this. They did it just for day. us. Someone like Jonathan <laughs> and Sarah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> right? <laughs> so you mentioned earlier that one of the events held at Chamonix was alpinism. Mm-hmm. That's also known as mountaineering. Now, we're not going to really go into it here right now. Um, we're going to put a blog up about this because there were actually no alpinism events held at Chamonix. So we'll kind of explain why it's <laughs> counted as an event since uh, Pierre de Coubertin did present an official gold medal to a group of people for it. But I'm just going to throw that out there right now that it's kind of odd because there was no actual competition around it. But on the bright side, it is kind of a little bit of a foreshadowing of climbing events that we have now in some ways. For now, we're going to go to one of my favorites, which is speed skating. So this is a brand new sport for us here uh, at the Olympics because it had never featured in any of the previous editions. And even more fun is that Charles Jutra of the U.S. became the first ever gold medalist of the Winter Olympics when he won the 500 meter race in speed skating. And he won by only 0.2 seconds. So sounds like it was a super exciting race. (laughs) All right. So a little bit more about Charles. He was from New York and he raced in three events total at Chamonix. But this was his only medal that he won. But hey, I'm not complaining because this means that both the first summer and winter gold medals for the modern movement were both won by U.S. athletes. So that's pretty sweet. Now, an interesting note is that even though Jutra was a national champ here in the U.S., he felt very unprepared heading into the games. He was actually getting ready to quote unquote, retire from the sport as he prepared for college. And he didn't expect to do a whole lot at the games, especially since, okay, get this, Sarah, because this blew my mind when I read this about him. So listen to this. He had never raced against the clock. He had never raced in a one-on-one heat. And he had never raced 500 meters because the U.S. races only went up to 440 yards. And also, he had never changed lanes midway in a race, as we're used to seeing in speed It's ridiculous. (laughs) Ridiculous. Yeah. So it sounds like he was really just going to represent the U.S. Mm -hmm. And that, hey, this will be a fun experience. This will be a, a good way for me to end my speed skating career before I go off to college. But he really had no expectations to actually medal and so this is really cool that he he won gold even though he had never done all of these things before i wish (laughs) i wish i had that talent in athleticism (laughs) yeah it's it's impressive uh but while we're still on the subject of speed skating in terms of overall success that title goes to finnish speed skater klaus thunberg who won five medals at Chamonix, including three golds. One of his golds was actually for the all-round speed skating event. Uh, That's the only time it's featured in the Winter Olympics. And yes, you heard me right. It's all-round, not all-around. But from my research, they apparently mean the same thing. So I, I don't quite get the distinction. Uh, But Claus would later go on to add two more gold medals at the 1928 St. Moritz Olympic Games. So you might hear his name come up again when we when we get there. And then uh, quickly, I'll throw in a little bit about ice hockey here because we both love hockey. Um, And it should come as no huge surprise, but Canada won the ice hockey tournament at the Winter Games. So they get to claim the very first, uh, you know, Winter Olympic gold medal for ice hockey here. And during the tournament, they were only scored on three times. 
Meanwhile, they racked up 122 goals throughout the tournament. I just feel so sorry for their <laughs> opponents. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's astonishing. <laughs> so, so good job, Canada. Way to go. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty incredible. Next up, let's talk about military patrol. <laughs> this sport is the predecessor for biathlon, but at the time it was a team event instead of individual. It also had three components instead of two, cross-country skiing, 25 kilometers to be exact, ski mountaineering, and rifle shooting. Each team had four members and an alternate. Switzerland won gold, with Finland getting silver, and France with bronze. It's been a demonstration sport in 1928, 1936, and 1948, but this was its only time to show up as a medal event, which... I'm happy that we had it since it was a predecessor for biathlon because I love biathlon. Yeah, me too. Um, I can't remember if I told you this with the recent Beijing games, but my son, Kai, discovered biathlon for the first time. I remember I was doing some work that day and my wife came back and she said, hey, what's what's that sport where they ski, but then they also shoot targets? I was like, oh, it's biathlon. She was like, well... Kai is in there loving every second of it. Yes. I said, yeah, of course he is. <laughs> it's just, it's so exciting. Teach There's him so much going young. on. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm going to sweep into one of my favorite events, curling. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we've got to talk about this one. It probably yep. won't come as any surprise to hear that Great Britain won the first gold medal in curling with a nine member team. Sweden won silver with an eight-member team, and France with a six-member team. Not sure why team sizes were not standard for everybody, but whatever. Only one other team, Switzerland, was entered in the tournament, but they ended up having to drop out before the start of the tournament. This wasn't too big of a deal since it was already planned to be a round-robin tournament, though. After 1924... Curling would make a few guest appearances as a demonstration sport, but would not become an official medal event again until Nagano, 1998. And those were some rough years without yeah. curling, so we're spelled its back. And and I think <laughs> I think it's here to stay. Knock on wood. Yeah, no, I think it definitely is here to stay. And I I remember when it came back at Nagano, and and frankly, here in the U.S., it was made fun of. Oh well, a yeah. Lot. But... I mean, we won gold and it's still made fun <laughs> of. Come on. <laughs> right. But uh, but it's fun to know that it was there at the first Winter Olympiad, even though it was away for a long time. But speaking of things sliding, uh, we're going to go into bobsleigh now. So bobsled, bobsleigh, Robert sled, Whatever you want to call it, uh, this was the only sliding sport to feature here in 1924. At Chamonix, there was just the four-man bobsled event where Switzerland won gold, followed by Great Britain in second, and then Belgium in third. Now, this was interesting to me, but the winning time by the Swiss was 5 minutes, 45.54 seconds. And just for the fun of comparison, I decided to look up the final for the four-man event at the 2022 Beijing Games, where Germany won gold with a time of 354.30. So just kind of shows you how far we've come in terms of the, the design of the sled and technique and all of those things in this sport. Yeah, it's pretty cool. In Nordic combined, Norway's Thorleif Hogg won gold, and then his fellow countrymen took silver and bronze too. In fact, the four top finishers were all from Norway, and fifth place was from Sweden. So there's Norway showing up, dominating yep. per usual. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we're going to be talking about Norway a lot <laughs> in the winter games. So just prepare yourself now. Just get your get your Norwegian flags out because they're going to be coming up a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, let's talk about Thor Leaf Hog for a moment because uh, he's he's an interesting guy. But he was born September 28th, 1894. So he was right around the same age as the IOC. And as you're about to hear, he won 
all three Nordic skiing events at the 1924 Games. So three golds, and this was his only Olympic Games to participate in. Now, he also placed third in the ski jump, though more on that in a minute. And all in all, he had a very successful Games. Then after his skiing career, he ended up working as a plumber. And then sadly, he died from pneumonia on December 12th, 1934 at only 40 years old. So so sad. Yeah, it's incredibly sad. Gone too soon. And I'm not sure what the story is for why this was his only Olympic Games. Maybe kind of like we've talked about with other people. Maybe he was the type who... He got his golds and was like, I'm good now. I'm going to go live my life. But uh, but still, he was an early giant in Norwegian sports. And mm-hmm. uh, goodness gracious, just knocking the competition out of the frozen water, uh, so to speak, <laughs> in the skiing events with his three golds. So now speaking of, uh, we'll talk about cross-country skiing real quick because one of his other two golds came in cross-country skiing which had uh two different versions an 18 kilometer event and then a 50 kilometer event uh in fact there was actually a little bit of olympic deja vu here because the results for the 50 kilometer event were exactly the same standings as the nordic combined medalist and the only non-norwegian to medal in cross-country skiing at these games was Finnish skier Tapani Niku. So we see Norway asserting some very early Olympic skiing dominance, which, again, no surprise since they kind of invented the sport 4,000 years ago. They've got a little bit of a head start on the rest of us. (laughs) And then finally, in ski jumping, this won't be a huge surprise, but... Once again, we see gold and silver being taken by Norway's Jacob Tollen Thams and Narva Bona. But the real story here in ski jumping is the bronze medal position. So originally Norway had a sweep with our buddy Thorleaf Hogg, we were just talking about, taking third. And U.S. ski jumper Anders Haugen was originally marked down in fourth place. Now, Anders was actually originally from Norway, and he'd immigrated to the U.S. in 1909. He and his brother apparently really loved ski jumping, so they had actually built a ski jumping hill at the Milwaukee Ski Club so they could introduce the sport to the public. So, cool for them, trying to get some more people interested in it here in the U.S., Now, he was 36 when he went to Chamonix, so he was definitely considered quote-unquote old in this sport, where all of the other competitors were easily in their 20s still. And then also, according to Total Olympics, there may have been some bias in the judging. It's reported that the judges, uh, so they were all European, and they didn't love the idea of an American encroaching on their sport, even though he was originally from Europe. That, that's one thing I don't get is, like, he's really one of your own. He just happens to have a different flag on him now. <laughs> but So get this. In 1974, during a 50th anniversary reunion of the 1924 Norway team, a sports journalist named Jacob Voga noticed a mathematical error in the results, which I get it. Math is hard. It's not my thing either. But my gosh. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, 50 years later, 50 years later, he notices this mathematical error. And so he reported it and he actually campaigned for the error to be corrected, even though this would mean that it would decrease Norway's medal count. Uh, So good for him wanting to be a fair sport about it and correct an injustice. So later that year, uh, our, you know, our guy, (laughs) Anders Hogan, uh, he traveled to Norway to receive his bronze medal in ski jumping at the age of 86. And here's what's cool. Thorleaf Hogg's daughter, Anne Marie, was the one who presented the bronze to him. It's so sweet. It is sweet, yeah. 
but Anders remains the only American to ever medal in ski jump at the Olympics. So, yeah. I mean, Sarah, can you imagine how it would feel to finally get a medal half a century after you competed in an event? Oh my goodness, no. (laughs) No, I mean, I can't imagine what it would feel like to get a medal a minute after I compete. But yeah, I mean, (laughs) I'm just so grateful that at 86 years old, he was able to receive it. He was still alive. He got to have a special moment. It's a shame that it took so long, but I'm grateful for our reporter that made sure to get the word Mm -hmm. out there and that a wrong became right. So, um, yeah, I just imagine it was overwhelming and wonderful and how sweet that it was Hogg's daughter that gave it to him. But what about you? What do you think? No, I'm yeah, completely on board with that. Glad that he got it. Uh, You know, obviously it would would have been nice if he had gotten the recognition there at the games yeah. <laughs> along with the other competitors and not when he was 86 years old, but at least it did happen in his lifetime. Yeah. And and even though like it was delayed and that is just not fun um, and it's icky, yeah. it, it, I feel like it's got to be better than when you're delayed in getting your medal because somebody was cheating like by doping or something like that. Right. Like it, yeah. it, it was good that they corrected it. It stinks that he had to wait so long, but I'm grateful it wasn't because his competitor was cheating or anything like that. So, yeah, it does appear to have been an honest mistake. Uh, yeah. Even though there may have been some bias in the judging, like we mentioned. Sure. Sure. As far as the results, it really, truly appeared to be a mathematical error, not some sort of insidious, you know, ploy by someone to keep an American off of the metal, you know, podium. Right. <laughs> so, so that's good to know, because again, math is hard. It is. I hate math. But let's take another quick little break and then we will wrap things up talking about the legacy of Chamonix 1924. So we will be back in just a sec. So talking about Chamonix's legacy, let's talk about the medal table. Let's do it. What a shocker. Like we've already said that Norway (laughs) topped the medal table with 17 total medals, including four golds. Which think about this for a second. They got four gold medals. Three of those were all Thor Leafs medals. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> not anyway, bad, sorry. Guy. <laughs> yeah, no, just it's not bad. Um, Finland was next with 11 total, also four golds. And then Austria with three total, two gold. Look at that gap. Holy cow. <laughs> yeah. Switzerland. <laughs> Switzerland also had three total with two gold. And then both the U.S. and Great Britain won four medals apiece, including one gold. So medals were given out during the closing ceremony by Franz Reichel. And since some of the athletes had already gone home, if they were absent, he gave the medal to someone else from the country instead. (laughs) Hopefully they all got their medals. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) I mean... (laughs) Like, this is before the age of tracking numbers and all that. So the closing (laughs) speech was given by none other than Coubertin himself. But obviously, the greatest legacy of Chamonix was establishing winter sports at the same level as the summer sports and creating a new Olympic tradition we all still enjoy today. Yeah. And that's a huge deal because I feel like to this day, the summer games still get a little bit more attention. I think at least speaking here in the U.S., um, they get a lot more attention than the winter games. But Mm -hmm. think about how much further behind winter sports would be if this had not happened when it did. Definitely. But that, my friends, is the what I would consider undertold story of the 1924 Chamonix Winter Olympic Games. And I'm so excited we get to finally add more winter sports into our conversations in future episodes. 
But if you enjoyed this episode, and we really hope you did, then come back next time when we return to Paris for the 1924 Summer Games and hear about how Coubertin's hometown gets the chance to redeem themselves from the debacle of the 1900 Paris Games. In fact, you might want to go back and give that episode a a re-listen to prep (laughs) yourself for it. But until then, ought to see you later. The Games Odyssey podcast is a production of Wardrobe Media, LLC. This episode was written, hosted, produced, and edited by Jonathan Jordan and co-hosted by Sarah Patton. Show notes, including research sources and transcripts, can be found on our website, gamesodyssey.com. Olympic is a trademark of the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee, USOPC. Any use of Olympic in the Games Odyssey podcast is strictly for informational, commentary, and educational purposes. The Games Odyssey podcast is not an official podcast of the USOPC and is not sponsored, endorsed, or officially affiliated with the USOPC or the International Olympic Committee or International Paralympic Committee. The content of Games Odyssey podcast does not reflect the opinions, standards, views, or policies of the USOPC, and the USOPC in no way warrants that content features in the Games Odyssey podcast is accurate.